All right, so the Maypole of Marymount, I think we can discuss fairly quickly. Uh, it's a, a shorter story. It is set in this sort of pseudo-historical context, right? And the, the book footnotes for you pretty well uh, what that context is, what a Maypole is, where Marymount was in relation to Salem and others. Uh, and we've seen some of these uh, figures actually uh, mentioned in earlier writings. So it is... Um, it is, you know, one of these sort of pseudo -histor historical texts, uh, which is really fun because at one point in the story, we're actually told, uh, on page, uh, 682, these were authentic passages from history. Well, in a very general sense, yeah, but of course, most of the details here are fictional. So, um, you know. Take that with a grain of salt, I guess. But most of what I'm interested in in talking to you about in the Maypole of Marymount has to do um, with the storytelling itself, the time, the passage of time in the story and the way that the plot is structured um, is different than anything we've seen yet. And just to reiterate for you um, some of the themes and, and uses of setting that we just got done looking at with young Goodman Brown. So it's very interesting if we talk about um, the plot here, it is a linear plot. That is, you are given the events, uh, um, <clears throat> that is, it's a parallel plot, right? You are given the events, uh, in the order, relatively, in which they appear. But you do have a very interesting, um, uh, use of, a uh, manipulation of duration, You'll see that the duration here in terms of the discourse time to the story time is very, very close. Um, that the events themselves of the story only cover a few hours, um, with the exception, of course, just like we saw at the end of Young Goodman Brown, there is a, a summary uh, in the final paragraph that tells you about the uh, the married couple and the depressing life that they lived after they were forcibly converted to Puritanism. Uh, <laughs> if, we, if we lay that aside, right, the, the story time and the discourse time are effectively equal. And But what we have in the middle is a beautiful example of a pause. This pause is a little more complicated than others because it involves um, sort of a flashback. Um, but it's clearly a pause because the entire discussion here uh, that happens during it, that is uh, from the top of page 681 um, all, until almost the very bottom of 682, is exposition by the narrator. That is... Uh, we're in the flow of events, right? When we get to the bottom of 681, uh, you have this strange conversation between um, uh, Edith and... Um, <laughs> ah, curse it all. This is the problem. Um... What is his name? Well, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll find it again. Uh, the young man that Edith is marrying. God dang it. Anyway, um, but you've got this conversation between them, uh, and, and we'll look at that conversation. But there at the top of 681, we have a pause. Um, it's indicated at the bottom of 680. Meanwhile, we may discover who these gay people were. And gay here, of course, just means happy. Um... So there's a pause. We're stopping the action to look at something else. And it just happens that what we're going to look at here um, is something that happened, we're told, 200 years ago and more. And what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at the settling of the American colonies, who's coming over, why they're coming over. You can read this for yourself and decide if it sounds like the accounts that we looked at earlier 
or if maybe Hawthorne uh, has a particular view of Puritans, right? And one of the things you should be looking at in all of these stories by Hawthorne is, does he have a particular view of Puritans? The answer is yes, right? Uh, and think about maybe how Hawthorne's popularity and the success of his writings um, has impacted the way we see Puritans uh, today, right? So, uh, there's some interesting commentaries in here, right? Um, basically, that they that they know mirth is the counterfeit of happiness, um, and, and they would not venture among the sober truths of life, not even to be truly blessed. Um, and then we're told about the hereditary pastimes of old England. Essentially, what Hawthorne is doing here is he's saying, um, God, there were some really great things about merry old England, right? Uh, and some people did try to bring those over. It wasn't just Puritans, that you had people bringing over the Maypole and drinking and the sort of carousing and um, this uh, sort of Bacchanalia revelry. And uh, the Puritans stamped it out viciously. And clearly uh, something that, that Hawthorne thinks is regretful. He says, unfortunately, they were men in the world of a sterner faith, right? Unfortunately. So he's not making any bones about it here. This is clear exposition by your narrator. Uh, and uh, it's all happening during this pause. And so I wanted to point this out because we don't often get good pauses uh, or we don't recognize them a lot of times when we see them. And so I wanted to highlight this one for you for sure. Um, and of course, when we pop back out of the pause, uh, after these authentic passages from history, we return to the nuptials of the Lord and Lady of May. Um no time or very little time has has passed right um just enough that now we're we're sort of down to the final hour of day um and now we need to talk about setting because something very interesting has happened if we look back at the beginning the very first word of the story bright now that's not very gothic Right? Bright were the days at Merry Mount when the Maypole was the banner staff of that gay colony. Oh, it's very happy, right? Very upbeat. And the word bright is the antithesis of everything that is Gothic. So what do we see now that we've returned? Even in that dim light is now withdrawn, relinquishing the whole domain of Merry Mount, to the evening gloom. Gloom. We've gone from bright to gloom. Enter the Gothic, right? And what has issued in the gloom? Well, literally, the setting of the sun. But look what happens. The gloom, we're told, has rushed so instantaneously from the black surrounding woods, but some of these black shadows have rushed forth in human shape. Something was there. Something was lurking. Something was watching. What was it? Puritans. <laughs> it's almost funny to us now, right? It's not funny, obviously, in the context of the story. Puritans bring the gloom. It's such a dramatic contrast. Such a change in the setting of the story from the first word, bright. We come out of our pause to rejoin the action. And what happened? Gloom. And it's there because of the Puritans. The Puritans who hack down, these, these are like fully armed Puritans, right? Indicott is this almost Arthurian knight on a steed with full armor and a big sword, and he hacks down the maypole. They round up the revelers, put them in the stocks, um, execute the dancing bear because they're afraid it might be bewitched, those sorts of things. But they take the young couple and they convert them. They see something in them. The 
According to Endicott, there may there be qualities in the youth which may make him valiant to fight and sober to toil and pious to pray. These are the values that they have. Valiant, sober, pious. Very different than what we saw in the celebration, right? And in the maiden that may fit her to become a mother in our Israel, bring up babes in better nurture than her own hath been. And in this summary of the final paragraph, we see the word gloom again. Endicott, the severest Puritan of all who laid the rock foundation of New England, lifted the wreath of roses from the ruin of the Maypole and threw it with his own gauntleted hand over the heads of the Lord and Lady of May. It was a deed of prophecy as the moral gloom of the world overpowers all systemic gaiety. Physical gloom, moral gloom, it is an allegory. Notice also on 680, there are references of this moral gloom creeping in. In the middle of the brightness and the joy and the celebration, where there is a reference to a pensive shadow of the mind uh, by Edgar. Here's his name. And Edith says, I struggle as with a dream. Fancy. This sounds a lot like the conversation between Faith and young Goodman Brown. She says, there is a mystery in my heart. And it's very interesting because then we get to another very young Goodman Brown type moment. We're told just then, as if a spell had loosened them, down came a little shower of withering rose leaves from the maypole. Falling pink rose petals, falling pink ribbons. This is really great. Uh, but the story itself is much shorter. I really just wanted to focus on the way that pause was used and the way that we shifted from brightness suddenly to gloom. All right? Uh, it's a fairly straightforward story. So uh, hopefully you, uh, you know, you didn't have any trouble with it. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And we'll spend more time on the minister's black veil, which is enigmatic.